Uh, so welcome and thank you all for joining us in this collaborative webinar and Q&A discussion. And welcome to everyone from across Turtle Island and the Indigenous Nations territories that we are located on. This webinar is brought to you by Ecotrust Canada and Wakotwin Development. And this webinar will be recorded and posted on our social media platforms for those that were unable to join us um, at this time. And now I'll just pass it over to David Flood, General Manager of Wakotwin, to provide a welcome and an introduction of Wakotwin. Great, thank you, Denby. Uh, bonjour, Annie Wache. Uh, greetings across Turtle Island. It's nice to uh, see the response we got for putting on this particular panel uh, and topic. Um, hopefully, we've uh, pulled together uh, enough questions to. Uh, maybe compel some uh, some interesting participation with the, the guests that have joined us. Um, we thank you for taking the time uh, in this uh, time of COVID and staying at home and work from home. So uh, enjoy the panel, uh, enjoy the responses, and we hope to see some uh, exciting uh, interactive questions as we move along. Miigwech. Great, thank you. Uh, so this webinar is focused on achieving Canada's climate goals, which require natural climate solutions. Indigenous communities in Canada are leading the implementation of natural climate solutions that harness Indigenous values, ways of being, and governance, while creating real carbon emissions reductions that can contribute to Canada's climate targets. This webinar provided by Wakotwin Development and Ecotrust Canada will focus on the ways that Indigenous communities are leading natural climate solutions and how governments in Canada can support this leadership. We'll share a short presentation, a Q&A panel discussion, and end with questions from the audience. The federal government's new climate plan, a healthy environment and a healthy economy, includes a natural climate solutions fund as a critical component to climate action. Wakoto and Development and Ecotrust Canada prove how Indigenous-led natural climate solutions align with Indigenous values of land stewardship through improved forest management and conservation, enabling job creation and self-governance by Indigenous communities. Natural climate solutions provide opportunities to harness carbon value on the landscape, while Indigenous communities create alternative economies and land governance practices. We'll begin with a short presentation by Isabel Allen, Projects Forester at Wakotwin Development, and Chuck Rumsey, CEO of Ecotrust Canada. Isabel holds her registered professional forester designation in Ontario. In her role at Wakotwin as Projects Forester, she specializes in forest management plans and Indigenous involvement. She recently graduated from the Master of Sustainable Forest Management program at the University of British Columbia, and has a BSc in Environmental Sciences and Resource Management from the University of Guelph. She's a member of Temiskaming First Nation and has enjoyed the opportunity to work with other First Nations on forestry related projects since starting with Wakotwin in the spring of 2018. Chuck Rumsey, CEO of Ecotrust Canada, spent two years as Vice President of External Affairs and Development, leading the organization's government relations, partnership engagement and fundraising efforts he also directed the development of Ecotrust Canada's Forest Carbon Initiative. Over the last two decades, Chuck has served in leadership roles with the Nature Conservancy, Tides Canada, and the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Following the presentation, we'll have a Q&A discussion with our presenters, along with David Flood, as we just met, General Manager of Wakotwin, Amberly Klakajisik, Pro Guardian Program Manager at Wakotwin, and Joseph Pallant, Director of Climate Innovation at Ecotrust Canada. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Isabel, who will be providing a presentation with Chuck on forests and climate action. Great, thanks, Denby. I just want to confirm that you can see my screen. Uh, we can't see it yet. Okay. <laughs> yep, that looks great. You see the presentation? And just the presentation? <laughs> yeah, it looks great. 
Perfect. Okay, so thanks for the intro, Denby, and thank you everyone who's tuning into this presentation. Uh, we'll be starting this webinar off, uh, as Denby said, with this brief presentation for some context about forest carbon management, specifically in the Magpie and Martel forest area, which is located in Northeast Lake Superior region of Ontario. This is an adaptation of a presentation that was given last February to First Nations community members who were affected by forest management in that area. So if you're tuning into this call, I am assuming that you're familiar with the concept of climate change. Uh, for this presentation, we're talking about big picture climate change. Uh, it's happening and it's caused by humans dumping large amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, especially carbon dioxide. Some of the larger global impacts that we typically think about uh, that are caused by climate change and increased global warming, <clears throat> increased severity and, fre and frequency of extreme weather events, and the disruption of natural systems and processes, which all lead to the disruption of human society and economies. On the smaller and more focused scale of Northern Ontario, uh, there are still climate change effects that are occurring and are likely to persist and intensify into the future and impact the day-to-day -day lives of the people that live here. They are uh, shifting seasons, disruption of water flows, change to wildlife habitat, change in wildlife movement and cycles, increased forest fires, early ice melt, uh, which can lead to transport and safety issues for communities dependent on ice roads, and an increase in pests that we may not have seen in this region before. So one of the natural systems in Northern Ontario that is helping to offset the global emissions of greenhouse gases is our forests, specifically the boreal forest. This conifer dominated landscape is able to sequester and store large amounts of carbon. Because the boreal forest is such a significant portion of the landscape in Northern Ontario, the effects of management on this forest have a significant impact on carbon. Improving forest management to include carbon management can help to mitigate the effects of climate change. Unfortunately, uh, the forest management processes that can increase the climate change benefit are also beneficial to the communities that live in them. So these are just a few examples of ways that forest management can create different climate outcomes, uh, conserving high value areas of cultural, spiritual, and wildlife value, uh, having longer rotation periods, which just means letting the trees grow longer before harvesting them, improving our usage of wood fiber that we harvest, so creating less waste in slash piles, improving the way that we manage for uh, wildfire and pests as they increase into the future, and stopping the use of aerial herbicide application, and producing longer lived wood products uh, such as lumber for home construction. So to connect the dots of climate and community benefit from forest management, um, forests affect climate, forest management affects forests, and communities have the power to affect forest management. So forest-based communities have a critical role to play in dealing with climate change by increasing their capacity to participate in forest management. So here are a few ways that they can do that. Um, continue Continually engaging in their local forest management planning process, or FMP, uh, because if you've been around foresters, you know they love to talk in acronyms. Um, participating in local guardians programs. So Wakatoan has started our guardians program in the Northeast Superior region out of Shaplow. Uh, I encourage everyone to check out our website at wakatoan.com or look up the National Guardians Network uh, run by the Indigenous Leadership Initiative. Um, and last, but I think most important, is participation as owners, shareholders, managers, and employees in the forest industry. If the forest is such an integral part of Indigenous culture, we need more Indigenous voices influencing this sector. So when forests are managed to fight climate change, communities can experience direct and indirect positive outcomes. Some direct impacts within traditional territories may be improved areas for hunting and gathering of food and medicines, 
new employment opportunities for community members, and enhanced protection of other community values. Some indirect benefits could be improved wildfire management and prevention, and the knowledge of being a part of a global solution uh, to fight climate change and protect the planet. So it's a lot of talk, but what are we actually doing? Um, we're currently working on the Martell and Magpie Forest FMP, the Forest Management Plan, uh, which <laughs> affects our owner communities of Brunswick House First Nation, Chapel Cree First Nation, and Missinabi Cree First Nation, uh, with Lakotawin leading the community consultation. The major forest industry company harvesting in the area is uh, Rayonier Advanced Materials, or RIAM, and the governing body is the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. So this will be my last slide, giving you the background information about why we're here. And now I will be handing it over to Chuck from EcoTrust to get into more of the nitty gritty. Thank you, Isabel. And uh, could you move forward to the next slide for me? Uh, and so I'm just gonna start with a very brief background about why EcoTrust is on this call with Walk and Tell. Uh, and it really started almost 10 years ago now with uh, EcoTrust Canada uh, being invited into the region by the Northeast Superior um, Regional Chiefs Forum uh, with the idea that we might support that uh, partnership around building what was called at the time a conservation economy. And the focus really there was about trying to improve community participation in the forest sector in a way that gave communities a greater say in how forests were being managed, while also ensuring that communities uh, derive greater benefit um, from that management. Um, and so one of the main ways that we began to look at the, a new opportunity besides traditional forest, uh, forestry opportunities, of which there are many, and, and Wakatona is doing an excellent job of developing. And in fact, on that last slide, you saw a picture of their uh, on the ground forest management company at work. Um, but another way to uh, enhance that role uh, was to look at this issue of managing forest carbon, something that industry had at that point uh, was not doing much of. Uh, and, and so we, based on our experience, in particular with a project called the Chickamas Community Forest in British Columbia, we felt there may be a great opportunity to work in Northeast Superior and create a new pathway through which Indigenous communities could have a direct role in management uh, management of forests for a very important outcome, which is climate benefit, and actually create opportunities to, to benefit their communities directly through that activity. Uh, next slide, please, Isabel. So um, our forest carbon management essentially has uh, a, a series of objectives. Um, one is to uh, look at the magpie, uh, Martell magpie forest and try and understand better what the overlap is uh, between climate benefit and other values, both community values, but also biodiversity or natural values. So how do these things interrelate and overlap and how can we manage for them together? To try and answer that question, we've developed a series of uh, scenarios to, to model in the same modeling environment that foresters use to do their forest management plan. And I'll talk a little bit more detail about that in a few slides in. And then from that information, we wanna develop pathways to, for revenue to be able to flow um, as a result of that forest uh, carbon management. And in particular, we wanna make sure that that revenue flows to communities and that we're supporting communities and be able to meaningfully participate in forest management that creates climate benefit. Next slide, please. So uh, when we first entered the project, uh, based on our experience in other jurisdictions, we wanted to look at a few key factors uh, in terms of trying to change uh, carbon management so that um, uh, we could create more climate benefit. And so those, generally speaking, involved exploring how to allow trees to grow longer before they're harvested, uh, looking at options for actually just harvesting less area um, and therefore it, it, trying to dovetail that with increasing the protection of high value areas, being those cultural use areas or wildlife areas. Um, we also could be looking at how to reduce wildfire impacts, uh, 
uh, through a variety of different management actions. And I should say we have not made much progress on that particular point. Uh, and then we can also look at options for intensifying forest growth as a way of, of sequestering more uh, carbon more quickly within the forest growing stock. Uh, next slide, please. So to try and analyze our options, um, as I said earlier, we had the benefit of, of being able to use the computer modeling that foresters were already using in the Martell and Magpie forest to create their new five-year manage, uh, forest management plan. So they use uh, a software called Patchworks. And what it does is it basically uh, virtually grows the forest over years, over 150 years, for example, and, and explores various options of where harvesters would traditionally go harvest the wood and how that harvest would impact both the volume of wood that the, that, uh, that the forest companies could bring off the land base, but also check in on other variables and values, such what happens to moose habitat, uh, what happens with cultural uh, use areas and those sorts of things. Um, so it's an important uh, lens through which the forest management plan is developed. And could you go to the next slide, please, for me, Isabel? And the question we had and was whether or not we could evaluate forest carbon management as part of that process. And so we're fortunate that we have something called a carbon budget model, which is another technical piece of, of software, which we could join up with what the foresters were using in their traditional look at, at forest operations. And by bringing the, a carbon budget model into play with uh, patchworks, we could now not only look at forest volume being harvested, uh, but we could also look at how different management scenarios would actually affect how much carbon was being stored on the land base and would allow us to explore ways to improve the amount of, of carbon that's being stored. Uh, next slide, please. And so we've actually engaged in that work. And so some of the uh, pre-work that goes into that is basically understanding um, without, uh, is to set uh, a baseline, if you will, that establishes the level of carbon storage that would be in the Martell and Magpie forests without any industrial harvest. And then we can compare what the carbon profile of that forest is under what's called the long-term management direction. Uh, and that long-term management direction is basically the input that people participating in the forest management plan use as their, this is as basically their default about how the forest is gonna be managed. So we can compare what I would call the new business as usual management of the forest to what a no harvest scenario would look like. And then a third scenario or group of scenarios we can then add to that is to take that uh, long-term management direction, the business as usual case, and to try and improve it by a number of different management uh, changes to how the management regime. And so we've engaged in, um, uh, in this modeling exercise and we have uh, tried to affect a number of different aspects such as when trees are, what age trees are harvested, increasing conservation areas, um, increasing areas um, of, uh, where forestry could be intensified, all in, a, in an attempt to try and uh, improve the amount of carbon that's being stored on the land base. Uh, next slide, please, Isabel. And so we have some interesting results today. Um, the, the work isn't complete, but what we have seen is that without a doubt, uh, small changes um, in how forests are being managed can actually create significant increases in, um, in how, in, in creating climate benefit. Uh, so in, uh, in particular, uh, our results around uh, increasing growing stock has shown that in a 50 year period, some would say five decades, which are the most important five decades we have ahead of us in terms of fighting climate change, that we could create uh, five to eight million tons more carbon, or we could keep five to eight million tons of carbon 
uh, or carbon and CO2 equivalent is what this firm, uh, what this term means, tons of CO2 equivalent. And it's basically a measure of how much carbon is being stored on the land base. And, and so that five to 8 million tons um, in that 50 year period is incredibly significant and could be of incredibly high value, both in terms of uh, its contribution to fighting climate change, but also in terms of the benefit it could generate uh, for the communities involved in that management. Uh, all that in these scenarios um, are, is occurring with a very minimal impact on harvest volume. And so we're yet to even uh, explore other scenarios that may even pr produce more climate benefit, but might have a, a more uh, significant impact on harvest volume. But even at a very low impact on harvest volume, we can see that changes in how you manage the forest have a big effect on, on the climate benefit that can, that can be gained. And you know, we're, we're finding other, um, other important um, uh, results as we go along. Uh, not least of which is that there are ways for that carbon benefit to come online sooner versus later. And one of the most important ones of those is by creating more no harvest areas or putting more areas aside from harvest and protecting them, you can actually get that climate benefit coming online, online faster. Next slide, please. So for us, um, an important next step then is to look at uh, if, if we can understand, if we can quantify how much um, uh, carbon we can put, we can keep on the landscape, um, we can then turn that amount of carbon into, we can then package it, we can quantify it and package it in such a way um, and to create what's known as a, a carbon offset project. So this is sort of the tried and true way of, and this is what we've used in other projects of ours in other communities, um, particularly here in DC, is to basically create a package uh, that turns carbon benefit into a carbon offset project. Um, these are fairly, these are, are, are rigorous um, uh, uh, packages. They uh, require that um, the improvement to forest management is above and beyond business as usual that you can actually verify over the long term that those benefits are actually happening, uh, that you create all sorts of buffers around risk, meaning that you know, if a wildfire happens or if management changes, you need to create allowances for that. But otherwise, um, what you have is a very um, uh, specific regulated uh, environment. Uh, both, there are voluntary markets, but also regulatory environments developing in Canada in which you can um, take your carbon benefit that you've developed, package it, and prepare it for sale um, on the market, and, and therefore start to derive revenues uh, from that work. Uh, next slide, please. Now, one of the things that we've encountered, and certainly in Ontario over the last few years, uh, is that uh, federal and provincial ch policy changes have a great deal of impact on how easy or hard it is to bring a carbon offset project to the market. Uh, and so how difficult is it going to be or easier or difficult is it going to be for a community to actually real to build and then realize the benefit of an offset project. And as I said in Ontario, it's been particularly challenging. Uh, and for that reason and many more, um, uh, Ecotrust Canada has been working on a more direct way to link carbon benefit to the goals that Canada has made internationally around lowering its carbon emissions. Um, so those goals set by the federal government actually create uh, a pathway, we believe, around which uh, Canada can look towards communities and the forests that they're managing, and, as well as companies who are partners in this, and um, identify opportunities for forest management projects that directly help Canada meet its bottom line of those commitments, for example, to the Paris Accord. And <clears throat> we think then, especially as you hear now that I discussed at the top of this presentation, that as Canada is developing a natural climate solution strategy, that there's this important opportunity to create a more direct link between forest management on the ground and those targets that Canada has internationally and its commitments nationally and to bridge the, uh, government financing 
um, uh, so that it flows more directly to communities who are participating um, in the kinds of uh, landscape scale forest management opportunities that we're talking about here. So we call this the Forest Carbon Economy Fund. Uh, Joseph, uh, who's on this call, Joseph Plant, will have a lot more to say about this if there's questions about it. But I, I, I flag it here because we think it's an important strategy that needs more development. And also, I think it's also important that we continue to innovate beyond just carbon offset projects to create uh, more effective ways in which communities can directly access benefits um, by contributing such an important thing for the federal government. I mean, uh, indigenous communities all across Canada in Canada's forested areas have this critical role to play uh, in creating these natural climate solutions and they should be benefiting it from it so that the federal government's massive investment in fighting climate change doesn't just flow to urban areas or to power, um, you know, to energy projects or transportation projects in those urban settings. What's happening in Canada's rural environment and forested communities has an incredibly uh, important role to play in helping Canada meet its targets effectively. And so there needs to be a better linkage between federal funding and on the ground action by communities. Uh, next slide, please. So just in terms of some more, uh, more specific next steps. Um, so we continue to work on our project development with Wakatone in this region. We have our scenarios, initial scenarios complete. Uh, there'll be more investigation we wanna do in that area, but we're taking the results we have to date and developing what, was, what is called a project information document or a PID. And that sort of sets the stage for creating either a carbon offset project or um, it could also set the stage for one of these alternative revenue pathways such as the forest carbon economy fund. And all through that, we have a number of challenges in terms of provincial and federal strategy, uh, both in terms of how they deal with um, uh, offset projects uh, and it more generally in terms of financing. We're always having to work with um, those governments so uh, they can, to prepare them to be more innovative and how they're addressing the opportunities that, that are in front of us. Next slide, please. On the community engagement side um, for the Martell Magpie, uh, we still have a lot of work to do in understanding how the scenarios that we're, we're, we're looking at um, uh, not only uh, improve uh, climate benefit, but more directly how those overlap with uh, community values as well as biodiversity values. So that's a, that's a piece of work that we're, we're beginning and uh, needs, to, um, uh, needs more development. Um, we certainly, as uh, Isabel was talking about at the front half of this uh, presentation, we want to become more engaged, um, especially with Wakatoan, uh, supporting Wakatoan and enabling communities as stakeholders, owners, and managers to actually be taking a primary role in how these forests are managed for climate. Uh, we have a really interesting question ahead of us about how forest guardians specifically could be more directly involved in that management for climate benefit. And that's one of the areas I think we should be most excited about. And of course, this, this idea is ensuring above all else that at the end of the day, that where community action creates climate benefit that those communities are the folks who see the benefit of that action, uh, particularly in terms of revenues um, for their work. Next slide, please. And so I'll just, um, this is my last slide. Um, and actually it's a summary, I think, of, of both the work that Isabel and I have presented here today. Um, but I'm just going to try and link it all together and, and point out that I think first and foremost, we need to recognize uh, in this case, Northern Ontario, but you know, it's true across the boreal forests of Canada and the coastal forests of Canada as well, that we have these globally significant forests that are um, uh, consistent with and overlapping and one with the cultural landscapes that are important for Indigenous peoples. And, and these are the same landscapes that they have been taking care of since time immemorial. Um, we also need to recognize that how those forests are managed, um, particularly by communities for their own values, can actually improve carbon storage 
and can help climate change in a really, in a way that we can quantify and in a way which we know from even our preliminary work uh, is important at a global scale, certainly at a national scale, but also at a global scale. We know that there are pathways then for turning that management um, uh, into, uh, into a way in which we can drive revenues towards achieving both, well, actually not both, a, a series of goals. So how do, so we can use forest carbon management essentially to provide revenues for climate uh, objectives, for community objectives, and for other um, traditional forestry goals as well. And finally, um, I'm just pointing out that um, we have more work to do between our organizations in ensuring we have a, a really good idea. And I think the panel discussion that's about to follow this will be a good opportunity to talk a little bit more about how we see communities more directly engaged in this question of forest carbon management. And so, and that's it, Denby. So I think it's back to you. Great, thanks so much, Isabel and Chuck, for that really illuminating presentation. Uh, now we're gonna move more into the Q&A session that will also include David, Joseph, Isabel, and Amberly. Um, as we move into the Q&A, please feel free to write any questions you have into the Q&A box, which we have open. Um, I think you can go to the more button and access that box if you're wondering where that is. And now I'm gonna go ahead and ask a few questions to the panel. As mentioned in the presentation, Wakotuin is developing a natural climate solutions forest carbon project. So I'm just wondering how, what the panelists think about how this project and other natural climate solutions promote indigenous rights. Thanks, Denby. Uh, David Flood here. Um, I'll, I'll just kick off a little bit um, just in terms of uh, helping the, the folks that have tuned in understand a little bit more about Wakotuin. Um, the, the, the NSRCF that was referenced before was a chiefs forum that acted as a geopolitical body. And in its exercise of trying to, trying to move the yardsticks on forest tenure reform, uh, resource revenue sharing, uh, increasing indigenous participation in forest management through consultation regimes, they started to understand that they might need a more actuating body, uh, an implementation style body. So what they actually did was chose to form Wakotuin to actually look at taking up the, uh, we'll call them the low hanging fruits that they've, they've put in place through their geopolitical agitations, if you will, over that period of time from about 2008 to 2015, 16. 16 is when Wakotuin was formed. And I was brought in as a, an, an indigenous registered professional forester in Ontario um, to help head it up as the general manager. And we basically have gone from one staff person to uh, six staff people now. Um, and that's pretty exciting when you think about from an indigenous uh, institution, if you will. And we were, we were registered as a for-profit entity, but under a limited partnership. And through that limited partnership, we're more like a social enterprise. We as the general partner do the work on behalf of our shareholders who are 100% First Nations that own the shares of this business. So any benefit that the GP rep, the general partner uh, embarks on or creates goes back to the communities. So it is a form of social enterprise. And to be fair um, or be clear, we've actually gone to government programming sources and they've accepted that. They've looked at our shareholder structure and accepted us making application to government program funds, even though we're a for-profit corporation to access funds to the benefit of the communities to explore a range of different uh, forestry initiatives we've had on the go. Um, we can't talk about the forest without understanding that uh, the name Wakotuit is about uh, a Cree philosophy, a Cree way of life. It's a living uh, practice that everything is connected right from the ground to the crawlers, to the swimmers, to the walkers, to the, to the sky and the spirit world. And we're all, we all exist in, in that plane uh, as humans and our animal relations and the natural environment we coexist with. So we look at this exercise as, you know, there's forest management planning for which most people would argue are timber plans. They don't do enough to promote uh, and embrace the idea of ecosystem-based management and address the declining species that are uh, impacted by 
timber management versus sustainable ecosystem management. So we look at this as if we can bridge uh, a more holistic approach to forest management by including forest carbon management from an indigenous worldview lens, uh, that sets us up for a whole range of conversations around participating in the traditional pursuits of forestry, which was, the, which was a driving mandate towards full participation in the benefits derived from forestry and forest management. That was our mission statement when we kicked off. Carbon management has to be on the table. And if it is, the treaties never negotiated access to management of forest carbon. The treaties talked about timbering roads and mines. So what I'm getting at is reconciling the section 92 rights holders as a province versus our section 35 rights in the constitution of Aboriginal rights, title and interests. And then I'll just echo it one step higher. Um, the area we're talking about is Treaty 9, it's two thirds of Northern Ontario. And we've been collaborating with our PTO, political territorial organization partner, Anishinaabe Aski Nation, to make sure that the 49 communities affected by that geography, affected by this project, have increasing tools to actually take to that Paris Agreement discussion that says Canada wants Indigenous people at the front end of providing solutions on the ground. So here we are. Great. Thanks so much, David. That was really clarifying. Um, Isabel, you also spoke to how forests are critical to fighting climate change and to linking climate benefit with community benefit. Uh, do, do you or do any other panelists have insight into how Canadian forests su support both local and global climate action? And I know you sort of just touched on that, David, but if anyone wants to expand on that a bit more. Sure, I can uh, throw in some numbers uh, for you there. So um, in Canada, we have 347 million hectares. Um, for perspective, a hectare is like roughly the area inside a track and field track. Um, so a soccer field or a football field-ish is one. Um, and that represents about 9% of the world's forest and 28% of the boreal forest globally. Um, and of that giant piece of forest that we have, 90% is crown forest. So it's managed by uh, the provincial governments. Um, so there's huge potential there to affect what's going on in terms of climate action, um, especially when you look at having indigenous led uh, climate solutions because 80% of those 600 uh, First Nation communities across Canada that are considered forest dependent still use the forest for sustenance today. So they're still very active and have a lot of like current values in forestry that can be addressed. Great, thank you, Isabel. Um, in the presentation, you also both discussed some of the community benefits of climate action. I was just wondering if anyone could expand on that, on what are some of the ecological, economic, or social benefits of forest carbon projects and natural climate solutions. Well, I'll just, um, I think one of the interesting things would be, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, this opportunity for, like there's this wide range of opportunities for communities to be engaged from leadership uh, all the way down to, to um, uh, companies and social enterprises like Wakotuin, but also uh, right down to individual participation through things like the Forest Guardian Program. And Amberly, I wouldn't, don't wanna put you on the spot, but you might have something to say about uh, where you see something like the Forest Guardian Programs uh, being engaged on uh, in this kind of work. Yeah, um, hello, my name's Amberly. I am the Guardian Program Manager for Wakatoan. And uh, we have a lot of exciting projects that we are involved with and planning to be involved with and grow. And that includes um, like solar, a solar project panel, solar panel project that we have upcoming um, where the youth would learn how to create, install, and maintain solar systems and learn about renewable energy and climate change. 
and we have a lot of other opportunities where youth are engaged in land-based learning, um, such as harvesting materials to build a birch bark canoe or running a birch syrup sugar shack um, or harvesting, harvesting efforts. And we're gonna be working uh, to create monitoring programs for medicines and these materials, maybe areas of concern, values mapping, um, and the youth are excited about it. And we have ways of incorporating elder knowledge. And once the pandemic slows down and things get more normal, we can start going out together on the land. That's great, Amberly. Thank you. And I just wanted to supplement from, uh, you know, from the 80,000 foot view of, of the conversation around how are Indigenous communities readying themselves to be part of this discussion. Um, as uh, Isabel said, you know, there's at least 80% of Indigenous communities affected or influenced by forest activities. They're forest dependent communities. Their territories still have forest cover. I mean, the takeaway there is the Indian Act did not give rise and neither does core funding give rise to lands and resource departments and communities. We have put together a framework through institutional development of Wakotuin staffing up and having, having our ability to support our communities in building lands and resource departments. The way we're gonna populate the lands and resource departments is by building human capital through our guardian program. So the range of activities that Amberly is re making reference to, that is the development of our youth and empowering them to become part of the future conversation. You have to have the seven generations thinking in, in your mind when you get involved in forest management planning. It's also about looking back as much as it is looking forward those seven generations. So the, our youth participation is gonna be critical in, in empowering community well-being and participating in the range of benefits. I'm gonna say this with, in the most humble way, our elders are still afraid to speak their mind to white people when they come into the community and they have to make these land-based landscape level decisions and provide feedback on their traditional knowledge, it's real. Oppression is real. We're still growing through and trying to reconcile this change environment we're trying to grow through. So in order to do that, we need the province and federal government to understand and, and, and believe that it's a good idea that we start to create and help institutionalize lands and resource departments in the communities. We have education departments, we have health departments, right? We have the administrative supports in the band office. We, we've got this land code initiative on for, in our reserves, but what about, you know, the continued right to, to, to go out and enjoy that terrestrial land base, which make up our Aboriginal rights and treaty rights? We're meant to coexist. That's what UNDRIP and FPIC is all about. So we're at quite a turning point. And I've actually seen it in my career as an Indigenous professional forester over the last decade and over the last five years. The pendulum is swinging quite quickly and we need to actually move, move at that pace uh, because of the uncertainty in the next decade. So I, I just wanted to, you know, you know, Amberly's pointing out some very specific projects. They are impacted by climate change. What does our birch collection look like, birch sap collection look like with climate change affecting us? What does the future of canoe building and re the resurgence of that, that vocation and activity look like with climate change affecting us? And ultimately, we do not think herbicide spraying is something that should continue to, to, to happen on the landscape. It's growing, why are you killing it? Thanks so much, David and Amberly. Um, and you mentioned this a bit briefly already, both of you, but I just wondered if you could expand more on in your work as an Indigenous Guardians Program Manager. Uh, why do climate action and natural climate solutions matter to Indigenous youth that you're working with? I think it matters to youth because we're talking about the future of the planet and their land, their community, their future generations. Um, 
yeah, it, and in, for some of them, it affects their way of life, right? Uh, especially depending on where you live and how you live. But a lot of people are seeing and feeling the, these effects and uh, especially the youth. Thank you. Um, I think the, um, I think just it's important um, we're, we're forgot a four letter word that goes along with our guardian program. It's called hope, H-O-P-E, hope. Youth need hope. They need to feel like there is a pathway built around hope that they can actually have an influence on their future. We have epidemic levels of suicide, drug use, substance abuse in our communities. We're still talking about road access communities that have this, Never mind the far north remote winter road access communities of Treaty 9. These are tools that need to be in place. If we have to be human about this and it's time to include Indigenous people in that conversation. Totally, thanks so much, David. Yeah, it's really encouraging to hear how natural climate solutions are providing hope for youth. Um, and the final question we have is that we've all heard about the federal government's new climate plan and natural climate solutions fund. Uh, do any of the panelists have perspectives on how these policies adequately support indigenous led natural climate solutions or do they support indigenous led natural climate solutions? Hi folks, um, I'll weigh in here a little bit. Um, so it's really exciting to see society, um, Canada, the federal government um, recognizing the role of natural climate solutions as part of the greater fight against climate change, um, as well as for all of its interconnectedness with the other issues that are important to us. Um, and uh, I, for one, am really excited about this increased focus at the federal government um, and the sort of actions that are really getting rolling right now. Um, there's the two billion tree planting program, um, which fills sort of a specific role in trying to put trees back on the landscape. Uh, and you know, for us, that's a really small piece of the puzzle as has been really well described through the webinar. I think the ability to improve forest management um, has it can have huge traction. Um, it's a way to have really fast, impactful carbon outcomes. Um, it's much uh, punchier to keep carbon on the landscape rather than to clear it off and wait for it to come back over the next 50, 100 years. Um, one of the things that um, I think is really important, and, and we do see, you know, really up to the minute in um, federal decision making around this is to make sure that we have tools to be able to quantify, estimate, quantify and report on the climate impact, the biodiversity impact and the community impact of natural climate solutions. We're all excited. Everybody's excited now. Um, there's even sometimes a bit of a silver bullet feel, um, which of course it's, it's not everything, but it's a, a critical thing. Um, but we, we really need to make sure that there are tools for the people who are making decisions around where money gets invested, where the billions of dollars get invested into nature um, to make sure that we, that we can have our eyes open, that they can have their eyes open around that community impact, around that biodiversity impact, around that climate impact. Um, the decision makers around that investment can decide what aspects of you know, that portfolio of benefit they prioritize, but without tools to you know, understand pre-project and then report over time on those benefits. Uh, I think the whole movement will be really hamstrung um, and would be more of a flash in the pan and have less of dur durable benefit um, because people wouldn't trust it or because the outcomes will be suboptimal. Um, so really excited about the way that, that that worm is turning, that that focus is evolving. And I think we really need to keep up that drumbeat. Um, to make sure that these projects can have the best benefit for um, communities, for the climate and for nature. We, uh, we coined a phrase at, at Wakatoan and I, I can't remember if it was Amberly or Isabel, um, but in our early days of our guardian program before Amberly came on in a full-time capacity, we had started to participate in um, competing site index uh, vegetation assessment 
uh, with our industrial partner to try and mitigate or reduce the amount of herbicide spraying. And through that exercise, we came up with the term boots on the ground. It's not a new phrase, boots on the ground, but for our guardian program, it means a lot. And to Joseph's point, it was how we see ourselves participating in the verification, in the field work. Our, our peoples were land-based nomadic, move around the land and the territory people. Our headmen and our families had operating areas within the full of the territory. We were not all in one place, all at one time. So in that regard, this is about boots on the ground to take up our, our responsibilities of stewardship. And that's what I'm trying to get at about empowering our youth to, to feel confident with their connectedness with their land and their territories as they grow through skills development and pick their decided pathways uh, through their gifts. Everybody's born with gifts. Not everybody can be a lawyer. Not everybody can be a doctor. Not everybody can be a medicine person. Not everybody can carry the water gifts. So boots on the ground. We need to move forward with more of our people out making those field-based assessments on the health and vigor and resiliency of the natural environment to feed back into, are we achieving what we think we're trying to achieve? Which is carbon sequestration as one of the key elements of sustainable forestry going forward. Thanks so much, David. Um, I just wanted to ask one question that was posed in the Q&A box before we kind of sum it up. Uh, the question is, how is forest resilience to climate change being incorporated into forest management plans or modeled scenarios? So do modeled scenarios account for changes in forest composition and complexity that are likely to happen as a result of climate change? And how is this being addressed in forest carbon projects? So uh, I, I will jump in quickly and then I'll let the others chime in as well, Chuck, Joseph. Isabel, Isabel is a project forester, but she does participate in forest management planning. Um, it became quite clear to us when we started to put forest carbon action and a priority on forest carbon management into the forest management planning process that, that was alluded to in the presentation around long-term management direction. So when the plan process occurs, they're looking for feedback in setting out the desired future forest benefits and the long-term management direction. Everybody's aware that in Ontario, there was an election that happened in 2018. There was a change from Liberals to Conservatives and the Conservatives decided to kill uh, the major uh, green on funds and programs designed to explore uh, and uh, the treaty that they had with Quebec and California around carbon sequestration and emissions. So the point is the pendulum swung. The feedback we got from forest manager planning currently today is Ontario is silent on how it sees forest carbon management within its forest management plans today. That's what makes this project unique. It gives some autonomy and voice to say communities can, right? First Nations can, and we want to become leaders in the way in which we see this, this change echoed across the landscape. So forest management plans are for 10 year periods of time. They can be amended. And so what we presented has not been adopted in the current forest management plan on the forest tenure. It represents the art of the possible. We still have a, a ways to go to develop it into a, 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 an actual project outcome. Um, and this is, sorry, and this is why we're, we're calling upon that 80,000 foot Paris agreement, understand that section 92 is, is, is answerable to the federal government. This conservative government took the feds to court when they first came in to try and kill that carbon tax on fuel. There's hostility out there. There's not been harmonization. To the cost of whom? The 80% of the First Nations that are forest dependent communities. We still continue to see our natural environment eroded. So we, we've got a lot riding on this. It's not just the impacts broadly of, of climate change. It's about reacquainting our, our indigenous communities off the federal land base and with our territorials, territories and natural environment and benefit from the resources as the creator had always intended. Thanks uh, so much, David. I'll just add on a, a more technical note very quickly in an answer to that question. Um, I think that uh, 
professional foresters and, and, and policymakers still have a way to go in terms of how they develop growth and yield projections around how climate change is going to affect forest growth. Um, so some of that's been incorporated into the management planning and into our models to date. The thing that's really missing that's most important right now is modeling uh, what disturbance is going to look like, particularly forest fire in the future. And that's where there are a lot of technical development is still required to understand the interplay between managing for forest carbon while the, while the climate itself is undergoing change. And I'll hop in with an unusual non-technical point um, around this question of, you know, the fact that the climate is changing and this will have effects on nature and these need to be incorporated into project development into land use planning. Um, and sometimes I think people will say, well, we don't really know what's going to happen. The land is changing um, and maybe we shouldn't be doing these land based projects. And to me, it's absolutely opposite and the other way. The fact that the landscape is changing, the fact that we don't know exactly what climate change is going to bring us means that it's all the more important to deliver projects like this to be active on the landscape so that we can be working towards making those better outcomes. We can be alive to what's happening and we can be supporting the communities that are ensconced within that reality as well. Great, thanks Joseph. Um, there's just one more question that I wanted to pose to everyone. So this, the question is, looking into the future, can you already see other areas in Canada that would be ready for or need this kind of project? And I'll just turn that to be, are there um, particularly Indigenous communities across Canada that um, are working on these kinds of projects beyond Northeast Superior Region? Uh, I'm happy to chime in. I, I would say that, um, so this project is unfolding in um, uh, the Southern Boreal Forest of Canada in the, what we call the tenured or allocated forest of Canada, where, um, where it's tenured for forest um, harvest. There are a huge proportion of the boreal forest across Canada that uh, 300 plus million hectares that Isabel mentioned is tenured forest. Um, we think that what, what is happening, the work we're doing with Wakatoan on um, this uh, relatively small scale um, should have some application to communities right across that tenured forest. Uh, at the same time, there are communities outside, living in forests outside that tenured area, where area which isn't subject to heavy forest uh, harvest, uh, where there are still really important and critical land use decisions uh, for communities to be participating in, uh, which is a whole other aspect of work that needs to, to, to development. But that's just my quick answer is across Canada's um, uh, northern forests and the indigenous communities whose, whose traditional territories overlap one to one with it, these opportunities exist and, and should be explored. I think there's a lot of opportunity um, and there'll be a spectrum of things that are addressable with the existing tools and markets that we have in play um, and then you know, the ones that are close and the ones that are farther along. And I think we need to work really hard to make sure we, we move way down that spectrum. So there are projects that are really straightforward, like on um, like the Great Bear Rainforest Project in British Columbia, like the Chequemus Community Forest, um, working in sort of big, fairly stable, uh, often um, coastal old growth forest realities where there's a lot of carbon on the landscape. We also see projects happening in Nova Scotia and in the Maritimes um, with a totally different um, forest type, very different land ownership type, but people doing really creative work to, to try to support those small holders and keeping that forest on the landscape. Um, I think as we move forward and develop these tools, both in the carbon offset space, as well as the other tools like Forest Carbon Economy Fund and work the federal government is doing to quantify and report on this climate benefit, that we will be able to get more and more project types um, you know, into the room, into the space, um, being driven by the climate benefit that they create. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I think that will conclude our questions. And if each of you would now just like to provide a quick reflection um, before we end the webinar, that would be great. And so maybe starting with Isabel, do you have any final thoughts to share with everyone? Sure, um, so my, my final thought on this webinar is that um, we know that in Northern Ontario, the four
forest is an important resource for the region economically, but we can't forget that it's also valuable in other ways, especially to the Indigenous people who have thrived in this forest for thousands of years. Uh, that's why I think it's important to have more Indigenous people uh, blending their values into the forest sector. Um, I think I'm correct in saying that there are less than 10 Indigenous foresters in Ontario, including David and myself. Um, so I always uh, want to leave presentations like this encouraging youth or youth at heart to see working in the bush as a real and meaningful career opportunity. Um, not necessarily as a forester, but in any forest related job. So thanks for hosting. Thanks, Isabel. Uh, Chuck, do you have a final reflection? Uh, I don't think I could say it any better than Isabel just did. So I'll just say that uh, you can trust Canada. We're, we're very grateful to be able to work with people like Isabel, uh, groups like Wakatoan and the communities they represent. So thank you all. Uh, Amberly. I was just going to note that um, through our guardian program, we undeniably foster connections to the land with youth. And I would just encourage people to take a look at a guardian program in your area or our guardian program online. There's a lot on the web. So check it out and learn, get involved, it'd be great. Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, Joseph? Thanks. Um, yeah, I also wanted to echo how enthused I am to be working with the team at Watokwin um, and at EcoTrust Canada as well on this work. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's an idea and a set of concepts whose time has really come. Um, and so that can be a bit anxiety producing because this is a very important moment and it's amazing to see so many people stepping up um, and leading that forward. Um, I do think that continuing to develop the systems at a Canadian level um, to make sure that you know societal climate action um, meaningfully includes Indigenous people and communities and interests is very important and the natural climate solution space um, is, is very clearly and obviously um, a, a space uh, where Indigenous communities are already showing um, a ton of impact and benefit and have so much more opportunity to deliver. Um, so I really encourage as people look at the whole scope and spectrum of, of how society works on this, where the dollars get invested, um, to really look at where does it have an opportunity to, to drive that benefit to, um, uh, to Indigenous communities, uh, to Canadian nature, um, and, and in a way that really packs a big punch on climate. Thanks, Joseph. And over to you, David, for our conclusion. Thank you, Denby. And uh, again, thanks for everyone that, uh, that joined the call. Um, I took a quick look through the questions, um, and I just wanted to close with a, a bit of a summary, but an overview of, of an understanding that our leadership team decided that tenure reform was something that needed to happen. So this forest, if you picked up, there's an amalgamation of the Martel Magpie Forest. Our communities are now shareholders on that forest. They're, they're, they're involved at some decision-making levels on the management of that forest. So you can see then from there, they've also taken the time to make industry or sector investments into a sawmill and a cogen. They've also invested in a harvesting company. So those are all traditional uh, primary elements of forestry and forest management. But why wouldn't we wanna be involved? There, there's no reason not to be involved in those sectors. They will continue to exist. But if we want to diversify, if we want to get involved in the bioeconomy, if we want to promote our tree to home and change the conversation on how do we provide shelter in our communities? Why are we housing starved? Well, if we are not these large shareholder companies that pay dividends out to people that do not live and benefit directly from the forest, we are there. Our communities are there. Our families and well-being need to be there. That, that is the premise of direct and local benefit. It's not just the job in the sawmill in terms of a socioeconomic measure. Our communities have taken the holistic view that that will make up some of our, our primary activity and benefit, but there's so much more we need to do. And we can't rely on the federal and provincial governments to solve our localized in-community issues of poverty, 
lack of jobs. We need to create that environment. And we see that this forest carbon uh, is an asset and it helps connect all of our dots that we see as important in the way we normally view the natural environment. And the federal government is telling the world that it wants us to, to achieve that. So we're looking forward to seeing what the next one to three years brings and uh, hopefully coming up with a project that uh, is palatable and a methodology that, as Chuck said, can be replicated across forest tenure uh, communities that are affected by forest tenure in the southern portions of uh, the boreal. And uh, yeah, miigwech. I just thank everybody for taking the time to join. Thanks so much, David. And thank you to all the panelists. This was such a great conversation to have today. Thanks for your time.